Hi, I'm Ashley Ford with Texas Lutheran University. Today I'm talking with Liz Murray, author of Breaking Night, a memoir of forgiveness, survival, and my journey from homeless to Harvard. Liz, thank you so much for coming out to TLU. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Now, your, your story is extremely powerful, and for anyone who's not familiar with it, you, in your memoir, you vividly detail a childhood of growing up with drug-addicted parents in the Bronx in a very rough neighborhood, and you, you and your sister never knew where your next meal was gonna come from. What was kind of that aha moment when you got to be a teenager where you knew that you weren't going to let your circumstances and the adversity you faced kind right. of pin, you know pin you down into who you were going to be as an adult well i think you know i had you know there was that transformative moment but in a way it was a culmination of already i would say sort of an unusual way to interpret my experience up until then and that was that my parents were for sure addicted to drugs and our entire lives together were shaped by that addiction and they got which is to say they pursued getting high every single day and it informed their decisions and it filled up our the hours of our day and it affected the way we interacted moment to moment um, and yet at the same time I also had an experience where in every other way that they could be apart from their addiction they were very loving people mm -hmm. and it was an interesting way I think to grow up because to have my mother sit at the foot of my bed and talk to me for hours and squeeze me and tell me how much she loved me and share her stories with me and my father take me to you know the library every Saturday and encourage me to read and and be there for me in those ways but then not be able to feed us properly not be able to get us you know organized to go to school or and have really the life that we should have had mm -hmm. to not have that but to have that love in place I think already I had had an experience that people don't typically have because here I was interpreting, okay, things are difficult, but I'm not necessarily blaming anyone for this. Like, mm -hmm. this is a bad thing that's happening, but it's not being done to me. It's a bad thing that's kind of happening to all of us. So I think intuitively what set me up later on for that change was to grow up with this lesson that people can't give you what they don't have. And when I understood that intuitively, it led to other things. So it led to, okay, like no one's going to show up and do things for me. It's not the best thing in the world, but maybe I'm gonna to have to figure out how do I take on responsibility for my life myself. And I think in a way I was primed by that collection of experiences. And when their addiction truly caught up with them and they both contracted HIV and our family came apart, we all went our separate ways and there I am as a teenager you know, I, sometimes they say things have to get worse before they can get better. Mm -hmm. And that love and that bond we had, it, it wasn't strong enough. You know, you need more than love. You need things to function. And before I knew it, my mother's in hospice and she's fading away and my father's in homeless shelters. And I was 15 years old. Yeah. And I thought a good life plan <laughs> was to sleep at my friend's houses and drop out of school. Because at the end of the day, I think I was pursuing family. I didn't have a family in place and I wanted you know, I just wanted to be around people who I loved and who loved me. So I hung out with a bunch of great friends until, you know, you don't stop to think, well, gee, maybe I can't sleep over people's houses forever. <laughs> and then I started sleeping in the street. And having that experience, being 15 years old, like, I didn't put it together all at first. Like, I didn't know I was homeless. And I know that sounds funny, but I thought that because I had so many friends and my days consisted of sleeping at their houses, visiting my mother in the hospital, and she was dying, um, sometimes having contact with my father and certainly being a very inconsistent, if not completely absent presence at school. Um, well, I didn't see what was about to happen. I didn't see what was coming. And basically what was coming was I thought I could knock on people's doors and deal with my, confront my problems later until one night, you know, my friends looked at me, hey, you can't sleep here tonight. Our parents said no. So I slept on the subway. Then I slept in the hallway. <laughs> I slept in the park and then I, you know, it added up after a while. In the Bronx, we have a slang term. And that term is, um, you know, if you stay up all night until the sun rises, we just call that breaking night. So I told my friend, I'm just going to break night, meaning I'll walk around all night until I did realize I was, in fact, very much homeless, stealing food, um, sleeping in hallways. And 
I don't know how long I could have gone on like that if not for the wake-up call. All those experiences yeah. came to a head and losing my mother, when my mother passed away, I had developed this, I don't even know what to call it, maybe it was denial or procrastination. I knew, like most of us know, right? We all know when we're putting something off. Mm -hmm, we all know, don't we? You know, I know. We all, I, I like to tell people, this is not just my weird, quirky story. It's all of us because we all can put our head on the pillow at night and we all have the capacity to close our eyes and, and dream about a better life. We all have that. And for whatever reason, even if we all know that it's important, we tell ourselves, I'm going to go write that book, you know, run that marathon, start that organization, um, be there for my children. I'm going to go do the great thing. Not right now. <laughs> you know, we kind of put it off till later. And it's not, you know, my best quality. And I just started putting off my life. I'll sleep on the street for now. I'll survive now. And school, I'll go to school later. I'll visit my mother in the hospital later. Everything was later. And when she passed away, I got this powerful wake-up call. Because there, I was at the age of, I just turned 16, you know, and, and I got to look mortality right in the eyes and say, okay, she had dreams that she wanted to accomplish, my mother. And when she passed away, it was so clear to me that you could go your, your whole life saying, I'm going to do it later. And for me, that was a wake-up call to, to be passionate about my life now. And what was that like getting back into school and, and prepping for college, especially, you know, Harvard? What was that process like? Trial how, by how fire. Did, how, <laughs> did, how did, you know, how yeah, did you even start that? To, to well, I mean, I knew it was after my mother passed away, I just had that wake-up call. And so sometimes we need the why. And if we have the why, I know why I should do this, you'll find the how. Mm -hmm. And the why was so clear. Because my mother had been homeless when she was a teenager in New York City. And she dropped out of school. And I suddenly realized that I was living in a cycle. You know, and I went, wait a second. This is that thing they talk about where you do exactly what your parents did. And I'm not immune to it. It is happening to me. This is not a rehearsal for your life, right? Your life is happening right now. You're not going to come back and try again later. Like, this is it. So with that in mind, I just started knocking on the door to go back to school. And I, I looked at, for, by the time I was starting, I was the same age as someone finishing. So that was a little problematic because I was knocking on some doors and people kind of looked at me and said, you should be applying to college, but you're applying to high school, you know? And, and that was tough mm -hmm. because I had been chronically truant and... I was hiding from the schools that I was applying to. I was hiding that I was homeless. I did not tell them. I had had a bad experience in foster care, so that was like my secret. I gave them my friend's address, and I went from one school to the next, and I got turned down flat. And it's like I summoned all the will in me that I had to just keep trying one more time. And I, I'm a big believer in that. You know, if, if something doesn't work out, it's, you can't take that to heart so bad. You just have to try one more time, and then if that doesn't work out, try one more time. And if that doesn't work out, it's okay. Just knock on one more door. And I think I had that kind of spirit in me. And finally, someone opened the door and said yes. And that's when I met an amazing team of teachers at this place called Humanities Preparatory Academy, which is an alternative high school currently in Manhattan. And it was the first year they'd opened as an official school. I walked in, I think, two weeks after they opened, after I'd been rejected, you know, in, in a lot of places before. And here were these wonderful teachers. So I did not tell them that I was homeless, but I began taking on a lot of classwork. I had this idea that I would catch up. I needed to, I was so far behind. So I took about 10 classes per semester. I doubled my course load and I hid my homelessness and I slept at my friends' houses and I encouraged all my friends to come to school. And many of them did. Uh, they encouraged me to stay in school. I encur we encouraged each other. And, you know, like one semester went by and I had great grades and another semester. And finally, I saw that literally one day at a time, I was carving out, you know, a new life for myself. Your, your story is also obviously one of a lot of personal motivation and especially as a, a not just a non-traditional student, I mean, a, a very non-traditional <laughs> student. I you could say, yeah. And uh, we do have non-traditional students at, at, at TLU and... What, what advice would you say to someone who maybe thinks, like, I, I can't start college right. now. I can't go back. There's what message, out of all the messages that, that you have 
do you hope that they would maybe take away from hearing you speak or reading your book? Well, I not only know what it feels like to be a non-traditional high school student going, the oldest high school student going and homeless, but even now, I'm a graduate student mm -hmm. and I'm 35. I just turned 35. I have a four-year-old and I have a two-year-old. My husband is in school full-time. You know, everything I do, I do to pay our bills and I'm balancing schoolwork. So I have, I'm changing diapers, writing papers. <laughs> I know that if someone's seeing this and they're a non-traditional student, sometimes you run into that. Um, so we have many different ways to come to our education. Some people will be international students. Some people will come from families who maybe you're the first generation. Yeah. So if I had a message to them is like, don't get attached to what it looks like for other people. Don't compare yourself. There's a saying, compare despair, but it's really true. You may, don't measure yourself by someone else because the second that you start comparing yourself, that person did it faster. This person's already you know, got a job in the field and they're leading and they're my age and I'm considering enrolling in college and I'm their age, right? I'm, I'm the age of my professor and I'm starting college. I know exactly what that feels like. And um, I say you make the road by walking. You do it the way you can in the way that works for you and do not compare yourself to anyone else because at the end of the day, all, it, all it's about, you're gonna get knocked down, you're gonna get discouraged, bad things are going to happen to you, but you're not defined by that. You're defined by what you do next. So it's about stick with it, drop the application. You did bad in the class, pick it up and keep moving, keep going. Because when you have that degree and you've reached the goal at the end, you, you achieved your goal and it wasn't about what it looked like compared to someone else. Amazing message, wonderful, inspiring story. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me and you know, really glad to be here.